and they, they picked me up and took me to a, a hospital. They put a cast on my arm. They gave me some penicillin, which was bad. I developed the hives. I had to remain there. Finally, they took us to a farmhouse <clears throat> and put us in charge of a, a woman named Hannah who was built like a tackle at Notre Dame but had a heart of gold. And she fed us, fed us hamburgers morning, noon, and night. It was horse meat, but it was a delicacy at that time. And I haven't had a hamburger since. <clears throat> and from there, they took us to a Russian airfield. And uh, we were treated to an evening with the uh, group there. And they plied us with vodka which was Russian GI vodka. It looked like gasoline and it tasted like gasoline. And we got looped and I didn't know that, I didn't know that the uh, men danced with men in Russia. And the commanding officer asked me to dance. I was a little perturbed. I didn't know who would lead or if we had to dip. <clears throat> well, we danced we had a, and they treated us very well. And in the evening they put us to bed on, on wooden boards. What we didn't know was they were on wooden horses and one wooden horse was lower than the other. In the middle of the night, these looped guys rolled over and ended up on a pile on the floor. And we were taken eastward and we saw tremendous devastation. Large places with, with the barbed wire around them, concentration camps. We saw the rocket attack on Posen at night and I was taken to, a, to live with a, the mayor of a Russian town. And uh, he put me up in a bedroom that had not been used in five years. And the temperature was below 30. It was in February. And I chatted all night. It was the worst night of my life. But they fed us. And finally, after three days, the mayor came to me and said, we've run out of food. Would you appear with me? To, in front of the Russian commandant to get us food. And I said, of course. So I appeared, and this mayor spoke English and Polish, and we needed a, an interpreter who would speak Polish and Russian. So I appeared, and I started my, my spiel to tell him who I was, and uh, then the Polish mayor would get up and interpret, and then this other interpreter would get up, and he was, a, he was sort of a, a flunky, he was trying to make points with the Russian general. And he bowed low in front of this general every time. And with that, he would boot me with his, with his fanny. And I was in no mood at that time to take that. I, I was tired from sleeping in the cold. My arm hurt. I was testy. And the third time he did that, I booted him in the fanny right onto the desk of the, of the Russian general who started to laugh and he gave us all the food we wanted. <clears throat> and then they, they flew us to, to Moscow. We had lunch with Ambassador uh, uh, Harriman, Averill Harriman. They called a press conference and I was able to send a, a telegram to my mother. I was okay. She had gotten a, my, uh, my family had gotten a missing in action telegram. They hadn't shown it to my mother who would have collapsed. And I cleared that up and I wired to General Partridge, head of the 3rd Bomb Division. I said, save my job, I'm coming back. And I, after five days, we left Moscow, came back by way of Poltava, Tehran, Cairo, uh, Athens, Naples, and back home where I resumed my job. And the war was coming to an end at that time. The last time I flew with the 100th was after the war had stopped. We picked up uh, uh, French GIs who had been forced into slave labor in Eastern Europe. And these were guys who looked like skeletons. We picked them up. We loaded the 17s with them. We would take them, we were supposed to take them to an airfield 150 miles south of Paris, and I decided I would take them over the Eiffel Tower. I told them where we were, and they all regurgitated, and the plane reeked. It was the worst decision I ever made. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I made a lot of other decisions. Like but uh, then the war came to an end. 
and I got my orders to go home. And uh, General Partridge, head of the 3rd Division, ordered a, an inspection of all the bases and parades on the bases because now the, the ground crews had nothing to do. They had worked feverishly, day and night, doing their job. They were tremendous. And of course, the flying crews had nothing to do, so they were trying to get some discipline in there. And so I took my orders and was headed up the hill toward my quarters, and down the hill came this motley group of people completely out of step with their shirts billowing out, and I started to laugh to myself. And as I passed them, one master sergeant turned to me and he said, Rosie, you would leave when things got tough. <laughs> and uh, I went home, and uh, I was assigned to be operations officer in the transport group, and I was not happy with that. I went to Washington, saw General Armstrong, was transferred to a B-29 group, and the war ended. And I came home, and I went right back to work at my law firm, but I was ill-prepared to do that. I had not rested. I had been in combat continuously. And I was not focused. And they were recruiting people to be prosecutors at the Nuremberg trial, and I volunteered. And the day the, the ship sailed for Bremerhaven to go over there, I met this beautiful girl. And within 10 days, we were engaged. I don't like to tell this story when Phyllis is here, but I couldn't tell the difference between being seasick and being in love, and I gave her the benefit of a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we stayed in Nuremberg, and it brought closure to me to see those defendants there who have been so powerful and done so much damage. 50 million people killed in World War II, cities and towns wrecked, families wrecked, to see them at the dock powerless. That did bring closure to me. Now, Phyllis has some interesting stories to tell about the work she did with I.G. Farben, which set up a plant near Auschwitz and Belsenbergen. Where they, but I'll let her tell that story to the group that we meet at lunch, I guess. And somehow Phyllis became pregnant, and we wanted our daughter to be born in the U.S., and we returned home. And uh, I must say that when I, I was so provincial when I joined the, the Air Corps. I, I had never been outside of New York except for I worked three summers while in college in New Jersey. And then in service, I met people from all over the country, from different backgrounds, and I understood the fabric that makes up America, the values of America. And I've been bonded together with those men on the crucible of, conduct, of combat, and I will be, be so that for the rest of my life. I've, I've been blessed to have had the opportunity to serve. Thank you.